Welcome to the Journey of the Christian Dad podcast with your host, Dan Lewigs. Who is the spiritual leader of your family? Is it you, your pastor, your spouse, the media? Do you know? I did, and sadly, no one was taking responsibility to lead our family. Well, friends, someone needs to take that job, and that man is you. You may not feel qualified. Some days I don't. With the help of God and a community of dads helping each other on this journey, you can be the leader your family deserves. Welcome. We've got Chad Williams with us here, author of Seal of God, uh, just an amazing kind of story in life. And when I think back to being a kid and uh, of all the things I wanted to do, I wanted to be you. <laughs> So Chad used to get introduced as Chad. He's got a Vans contract. You remember the shoes and the skateboards and all that stuff. That was him. Had the coolest truck, had the coolest life. Like everything was great. He was the athlete, the stud of the, the class and like that guy, you know, just natural born leader ability, those type things. And then uh, the story goes from there and he becomes a Navy SEAL. Who didn't want to be a Navy SEAL? <laughs> the ultimate, like just incredible. Uh, and then you go on, write a book called the seal of God. And that's kind of how we got to where we are today. Having you here with us, I do it a little bit of research and I hit a couple of your videos and I'm like, wait, that says 1.5 million views. <laughs> this one says 1.3 million views. Now, that's a big number. So I got to see you speak in person. We got to meet and talk and just loved what you had to say. And I really wanted to have you here. And then the, the more we've gotten to know each other, the more I'm like, oh my gosh, you, you totally fit for the journey of a Christian dad podcast. Like, I just love it. Uh, masculinity and fun, enjoyment, fitness, uh, you know, quoting scripture off the top of your head. I'm like, this is awesome. So I, I'm really, really fired up to have you with us here. I could go on for the next 45 minutes until the podcast is over with my excitement, <laughs> but I'll stop. <laughs> well, thank you for having me on, Dan. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm just thankful for, you know, your, your candor and, and your love for the Lord. That's very evident. Yeah. Well, I'm thrilled, man. It's, it's one of those things with guys, we can hide our, our faith in the Lord. Um, sometimes guys aren't as bold as they could be. Sometimes guys don't have that community around. So it's just awesome when you meet somebody that is already on that level and uh, it's fantastic. And then you're, you just super bold, not afraid to share your faith. I wouldn't say not afraid. <laughs> I think sometimes you just got to push through it. Right. Uh, I've got this uh, mentor by the name of Ray Comfort, who has been doing evangelism for a long time. He'll address you know, hostile crowds of people in Huntington Beach, sometimes, you know, there'll be over a couple hundred people there that are, are shouting him down, trying to do everything they can to uh, just distract him, get him to trip up on his words. And he's been doing this so long, it, it seems like he's absolutely fearless. Uh, and I was very thankful, you know, for his honesty as he, you know, shared with me that, you know, a lot of times he goes into it, dragging his feet you know, but the outcome ultimately is, is clicking our heels on the way out. And I think that's how all of us, you know, feel whenever we're entering into, you know, an opportunity to share the Lord as we go into it, dragging our feet. Uh, but you should come away with that feeling of, of clicking your heels, even if it didn't go that well, you, you know, you know, at that moment, you were about your father's business and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And it's a good feeling. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. It really is. Yeah. I've, I've had that feeling, uh, <laughs> daily. It's like a Labrador jumping in the water, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. this is where I belong. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Well, tell us a little bit about like, I alluded to the vans and the different things, but tell us a little bit about your just upbringing and, and how you got to where you are. I'll, I'll let you kind of take it and, uh, give your version. I know I've got my version. <laughs> Sure. Um, I, I think that, you know, my, my dad, he definitely did a very good job of spending a lot of intentional time, you know, with me and, and investing into me and uh, probably developing a lot of, of self-confidence and, and not allowing me to give up or, or quit 
you know, on whatever it is that we were working on together, whether that be, you know, running for a long distance, um, doing pull-ups on a, on a pull-up bar together or baseball or skateboarding. And so he really instilled in me uh, just that, that discipline and investing into something that's, you know, long-term, not looking for that instant gratification. And so that really paid off in a lot of ways. I, I you know, tasted, I guess you could say some success uh, with baseball. And then the big one was skateboarding. That was something that I was really into in those you know, younger years, junior high, going into high school, I got sponsored by Van Shoes. And that was kind of a big deal for, you know, a, a young guy you know, at the time, because here I am getting, you know, the brand new shoes that aren't even out yet months in advance. And kids are like, Hey, where did you get that? You know? And I kind of became that guy in high school. My identity was attached to it. Like, Hey, that's chatty sponsored by Van Shoes. And I never really realized uh, just how important that was to me until I kind of got burned out on the skateboarding. And I find myself graduating high school, attending a, a local community college because I didn't really have any academic aspirations. And suddenly I'm kind of turning into this, this, this loser, you know, that some of the skateboarding world, you know, crept into my life that had nothing to do with actually being on that board, you know, the smoking and, and drinking and uh, everything kind of began to unravel. And next thing you know, I, I don't want to compete anymore. And if I'm not competing anymore, Van Shoes is like, we don't want to sponsor you anymore, whatever. And so now I'm not sponsored by Van Shoes. I'm failing almost all my classes at the local community college. And I'm realizing that my identity has kind of just disappeared like a vapor, like smoke in the wind. And a lot of my friends that were my friends at the time suddenly aren't my friends anymore, you know, because I'm no longer that guy that has that success, that has that identity. And so that kind of hurt, that stung. And I remember sitting there in the school parking lot towards the end of the year, it's time to take finals. I'm not passing any of these classes and it's my own fault. I've just been ditching, hanging out with friends, going surfing. I, I realized like, wow, I'm turning out to be a loser. I mean, the kind of guy that I do not want to be, this is not the kind of guy that my dad had instilled in me. You know, he always pointed me in the direction of, you know, you could do whatever you want to do. You know, and, and that's true. You know, when you're young, that word potential that gets thrown around, it's not cliche. You really can, but you have to apply yourself. And so I realized that the trajectory I'm on right now is a bad one. I need to turn this thing around somehow. And I know you got to be passionate about whatever it is that you do do. And I'm not passionate about school. My heart is not in it. I don't have a <laughs> love for it. And so I'm thinking, what can I do with my life? So pa pause on junior college for just a second. What sure. about junior college? Can you be passionate about? Like I was there. And when I heard you say that, I'm like, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm picturing you in my parking lot at my junior college <laughs> with the big open space that you're about to talk about. And yes. Right. And you know what I was missing, I guess you could say on the academic side of things was aim. You know, if you, if you have an aim towards, you know, you want to be an engineer or you want to be a doctor, you know that junior college is really just one of those practical stepping stones to getting there. But I had nothing. And you know that saying, if you aim at nothing, you will hit it. And so I knew that's exactly what I was aiming at. And I was hitting nothing dead on. And so I have to capture, you know, the vision, like, what is my goal? And I think that's true of anybody, starting off with anything. Like if you hope to just with your eyes closed, pull the trigger and wind up hitting a target. Yeah. Good luck. It doesn't work that way. In fact, that's, that's a principle, you know, that we adopt in SEAL training. It's a fundamental of shooting. Uh, we say aim small, miss small. And the idea behind that is if I'm just aiming at some enemy insurgent that's bearing down on my team, trying to flank us, and he is my target, I'm just trying to put a, a round in him somewhere and I miss, well, what happens? Well, I don't hit the target at all. I miss. But if I aim small, suppose I'm looking at him and I go, I'm not just trying to hit this guy somewhere. I'm looking for, okay, got it. Second button down on his t-shirt. Now I'm <laughs> aiming very small. Well, if I miss, the miss will be small as well. So maybe I don't hit exactly that button that I was targeting, but I do still hit my goal, which was to put something through him. And so the more particular you could get about whatever goal that it is, whatever you got in your crosshairs, the 
the better shot you have of actually finding yourself hitting that goal that you're going after. And so I think that that's just how it works. You don't get on an airplane and, and hope that it takes you to the place you want to go to. You, you better know what your destination is. And so I was at a point where I was adrift. I didn't know, you know what my goal, what my destination was. But I knew in general, I, I don't want to be a loser. I want to do something big, something great, something significant. So I start kind of thinking in, in those types of those, those areas, like, okay, what's something big and something great that I could do? One of the things that came to mind and this was a big, great thing to me was go to Alaska and go become an Alaskan crab fisherman. And so I started getting excited about that idea. I'm playing with it in my mind. You know, I've watched Deadliest Catch and I believe I could do that. I want to do something manly, something tough, something difficult. I want to go climb a mountain. And so I almost settled on that when this other idea popped into my mind, like, wait, no, why can't I go join the military? And not just that. Now I'm focusing in, I want to be a part of like special forces and I'm zeroing in on, you know, the branch, the Navy, the Na I know what I want. I want to be a Navy SEAL. And so, boom, there it is. There's the target in my crosshairs that I never had before, but now I've got it and I'm ready to start pulling the trigger. And I felt like that was probably the most difficult part of the whole journey. It's just coming up at that target. That's the worst feeling in the world, you know, ha having nothing that you're aiming at and just hoping somehow it all just just works out. And so now that I had this target, it's just a matter of practical steps, you know, to getting there. And so I was so dead set on it. I, I knew that now that I have my, my what, you know, and the why was kind of simultaneous, simultaneous, yeah, yeah. like the why has got to be good. And I, did, I did want you feel it kind of so just bad. pulled you towards it. What's that? Did you feel like it kind of just pulled you towards it? Yeah, I think in the back of my mind, I was always enamored with it and always thought highly, you know, of the Navy SEALs. Everyone always speaks of them as just incredible, elite. And what hit me was like, why well, just like talk about it as though it's unattainable or talk about it as though it's for other people to do? Like, why, what's stopping me? No mm -hmm. one's stopping me. You know, what's holding me back? You know, all I need is my shot. Give me a shot at it. And I think I could get through the program. I'm not going to ring that bell. I'm not going to quit. And so I already determined in my heart, in my mind, that I want that so bad that I will, I'll die before I quit. And I think I had an idea of just how difficult it was, not just from talking with other people about it, but one of the only books that I ever read, you know, from cover to cover uh, as a young man was Rogue Warrior by this guy, Richard Marcinka, who was like the founder of SEAL Team 6. And so I already kind of had an idea of like what it was to go through SEAL training and okay. to be a Navy SEAL. And so I had the heart for it, you know, but that's something inside, that's something internal, you know, and, and really, you know, actions speak louder, right, than words. And so it's time to express it. I was so all in on becoming a Navy SEAL that my very first step as I'm sitting there in the school parking lot about to go take finals that I didn't prepare for, my first step was this. All right, if I'm gonna be a Navy SEAL, my first order of business is this, I don't need to go to school anymore. So I started my truck up and just took off out of that school parking lot and went straight to another schoolyard that was across the street from my folks house and immediately started preparing. <laughs> so pull ups on the pull up bar. I'm doing dips. I'm doing push ups. And uh, of course, I got to let my dad know eventually, though, some bad news. So, so is this an elementary school or, or? This one across the street was like a pre K. Um, <laughs> like it was, it was like a daycare. And so it, it's actually, it's a church. And then they had, you know, like a pre K over there. I remember getting kicked out. You know, this guy comes over like, hey, what are you doing over here? And I'm trying to tell him like doing something noble. You know, I'm preparing to become a Navy SEAL. And he's like, get out of here. You're gonna have the cops come. You're trespassing. It's like, what? <laughs> you don't understand. There is no other option. I'm doing this. <laughs> right. I like, go ahead, call the cops. You know, and like I'll tell them what I'm doing. I'm preparing to be a Navy SEAL. <laughs> I'm picturing these two foot tall people running around and then you doing crazy Navy SEAL training and and in my mind I'm just like now that I've decided I'm beginning to you know become a Navy SEAL I'm like the star of my own you know movie it was funny 
But I gotta let my dad know some bad news and good news as I presented it. And so, you know, obviously the bad news being that he didn't know this whole time I was failing all my classes. And it was, like I said, my own fault. I just wasn't showing up. And, you know, he is just like, whoa, what? And then I, and he wants to know what's the good news. Um, I was waiting for that. It's all right, dad, I got a plan. And so I'm excited to share with them. I'm like, I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. And so at this point, you got to kind of put yourself in his shoes. You know, he's kind of looking at the track record <laughs> of my life. And what it is, is like, I get obsessed with something and I exploit it from every possible dimension. I get good at it, but then I get over it. I get burned out. And so that's kind of been the case with a lot of different things that I picked up and put down, whether that be like the baseball or the skateboarding. And so he's observed that and he goes, son, joining the military is not like any of these other things you've done in your life in the past, like playing ball or, or skateboarding. He goes, if you join the military, and then you find out, oh, this isn't really for me. Or suppose you quit and don't make it through SEAL training. He goes, just to be clear, uh, you will still be in the military. There's no getting out. And you're probably going to get a job like chip and paint off some boat in Japan. And those words, they really rung true, you know, with me. And, and I was just determined, like, I will not be that man. And so actions speak louder than words, right? I kind of storm off. And I just start preparing, you know, from that point forward daily, I, I'm putting myself through, you know, workouts, I'm watching the Discovery Channel, because they had come out with a documentary on uh, SEAL training for Bud's class 234, watching it religiously, like every day, uh, any anything that I can glean, you know, from watching the video footage in terms of like how the instructors are treating, you know, the students, the workouts that they were putting them through. And I was trying to program, you know, my workouts that way. And so this ultimately leads to my dad, you know, inviting me back up into his room one day and, and he wants to have a discussion. And so he's like, so you really want to do this, huh? I'm like, yeah, dad, I want to be a SEAL. And he goes, great. Well, I set up a workout for you with a Navy SEAL. Check out my computer screen. <laughs> and I'll never forget looking over at that screen thinking my dad doesn't know any Navy SEALs. Like who, who fooled him? You know, he doesn't understand how the internet works. People can claim to be anything they want. And this email just says, can Chad come out and play tomorrow? That's all I see. I'm looking at the email, looking at my dad, like, dad, let me get this straight. You met some guy off the internet, says he wants to play with me, and you're arranging this whole thing right now? And he's just like, he's a SEAL, son. I'm trying to tell him, you can't trust everything someone tells you on the internet, dad. And he goes, no, this guy's really a SEAL. Thinking, how did he get a hold of a SEAL like this, right? And so I go, whatever. I'll, all right, I'll go meet up with the guy. And I was very skeptical. Well, there was actually more of a conversation that took place on the phone prior to that email that I had no clue about at the time. <laughs> and I found out about this months later, but I'll give you, know, you and the listeners the backstory up front. So on the phone, my dad's telling him like, hey, look, my son, he wants to be a Navy SEAL, but here's what I think. I think he has no idea what he's getting involved in. Like he has no idea what he's signing up for. And so I'm asking for a big favor right now. Would you be willing to meet up with my son? And what I'm asking you to do, I need you to crush him. <laughs> like, <laughs> just give it to him, bury him, beat this desire of becoming a seal Set out of him. Set you up for an ambush. <laughs> <laughs> or a test fire, you know? <laughs> and so the guy thinks about it for a while and he sends off the reply in the email. So that's what I read is just that reply, can Chad come out and play tomorrow? No idea what I'm getting involved in. Like you said, pretty much an ambush. I find myself going for a run with this Navy SEAL, you know, in, in the wetlands. And out of nowhere, I'm just physically assaulted by him. To this day, looking back, I'm still surprised that he did that. Because if someone <laughs> asked me to do that for their kid, I'd be like, you know, I, I wouldn't do what Scott did to me. He could have gone to prison for what he did. <laughs> <laughs> punches me in the stomach i'm knocked down on the ground he's jumping on top of me this poof of dirt up all around me and he's just ragdolling me throwing me around i remember that the sound of the threads of my shirt just like ripping spit flying out as he's just screaming like veins bulging out feeling things hit me in the cheek and the forehead and and I'm thinking you know put yourself in my shoes here we're in the middle of the wetlands nobody around i'm thinking 
child predator. Like this is happening right now. The guy's attacking me. But then these words come through. He says, you want to be a Navy SEAL? You better stay three paces behind me. And I don't know how to explain it other than like time froze, pain went away just for a moment. And I had this clarity, like this is it. And this is for real. And if I quit right now, this is it, man. I'll forever be a quitter. Like the way I respond in this moment is going to affect the trajectory of the rest of my life. I knew that if I quit right there, oh, I couldn't live with that. I just couldn't live with that for the rest of my life. And so I just determined like, man, I'll die before I quit. And so he gets up and he says it one more time, three paces. He turns around and just takes off and I'm going after him. And he is trying to shake me and get rid of me. And I am doing everything I can to stay on his heels. And this goes on for miles. And to be honest with you and everyone, like looking back after having gone through SEAL training, I can easily say that I never went through a singular workout. I should call it this beatdown session than this encounter with this Navy SEAL. I never hurt so bad. I never suffered so much just trying to stay with him on his heels. Now we finally get to this point where he ends it. He circles up and he's kind of pacing back and forth. And I have no idea what's going on inside of his head. And I have no idea what's next. And I'm terrified for it. And so I'm thinking this guy looks like he wants to fight me. And so I'm like this teenage skater punk kid. I don't want to project to the Navy SEAL that, you know, I'm willing or wanting to fight him at all. And so I'm kind of like looking down and, and having this sort of self-talk, this dialogue, like, all right, Chad, don't set this guy off. Like no direct eye contact. Just use your peripherals. Don't look them in the eyes. <laughs> and he breaks this like really awkward tension uh, just by throwing a question out there to me. He goes, hey, if we would have gone another mile or two, would you have stayed with me? And I just told him, I said, Scott, I'll die before I quit. Well, he goes from this stern look like this guy wants to fight me to suddenly demeanor changes. He's smiling and he's going, great. You want to meet up again for another workout tomorrow? And I'm honestly in my mind thinking, dude, like, are we going to address that flashback he had on the trail? The guy attacked me. And now he's like, do you want to work out tomorrow? And so I'm like, I'm not going to ask, like, tell him, like, hey, the, what was that back there? And so I just, I agree. I go, yeah, sure. I'll meet up again for, for another workout. <laughs> so I'm going back home in a way, kind of feeling like, a little defeated, you know, because I just got beat up by this guy. But what am I going to do? He's a Navy SEAL. And then I start realizing like, hey, you made it through a SEAL workout today. And if that's what it takes, I could do it again tomorrow. And I'll do it again the next day after that and the next day after that. And so I went from this feeling of sort of dragging my feet, kicking rocks on the way back home to like, I am excited. And so I get home. My dad can't wait to find out how this little arrangement went. So as I'm reaching for that front door, he's already pulling it open. And so I'm stepping through and he goes, hey, how did it go? And I'm kind of just jumping through with my arms open. Dad, I did it. I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. And I remember like the look, I was just like, just shock on his face. Like what? And I didn't understand why he was looking at me like that. Looking back now, now I know because that I survived the ambush. And uh, from that day forward, I began to meet up with this Navy SEAL by the name of Scott Helvinston. And, and thankfully, it was no longer uh, a beat down. It, it became more of a, a building up. And I kind of moved on. You know, that, that first day when I introduced myself to him, he just started calling me Bubba. All right, Bubba, come on over here. All right, Bubba, let's go do this over there. And so I was Bubba for a while. Uh, but eventually I became junior, you know, he really <laughs> took me under his wing as he's mentoring me and uh, really just investing into me. And, and he really showed me the second person, my dad would be the first, uh, but he was like a second father and, and he showed me what it was to be a servant leader, you know, somebody that puts the needs of others, you know, ahead of their, their own. And he got me prepared. He got me ready. To make it through SEAL training. And so the, the next step was to, to be signing up. <laughs> Do you, uh, it, it sounds like you didn't have any hesitation about signing up. There wasn't that pause, maybe. It might sound that way, but really there, there was. Because okay. at, while I knew that I wanted to do this, I also knew 
Like it would just, it would kill me if I failed somehow. And the possibility of failing never came in the form of quitting. But I realized like, hey, there's, uh, there's certain qualifications that you, you got to make like run times and swim times. Mm-hmm. And, and so I knew I could do all of that, but there are things that are completely out of your control that can take you out of the game. You know, if you break your leg in half, which literally happened right next to me in seal training, uh, that guy's out, no matter how bad he wants it, dude, you're, when your, your legs broken in half, you're out. And so it could be taken from you. And so that was scary too. And that might be why a lot of people don't like to clearly define, you know, what their goal is because they're afraid of like, once they have it, they're afraid of failing at it. And so I was a little nervous in in that aspect. Uh, Scott did have to have to kind of prod me to get outside the bird's nest and go for it. You know, I remember him saying like, all right, junior, when are we going to get this ball rolling on you and going and seeing the recruiter, you know, because he mm-hmm. said I was ready, you know, and he thought I'd been ready for a while and I was kind of getting comfortable just training with him all the time, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I did, I, I finally saw that recruiter and signed up and, and that was just a, a rush, you know, knowing I've got a date it's set now. I'm going to be shipping off for boot camp and, and get this ball rolling. I had a, I had a slight pause when I went into the army, when they said, here, sign here. It's a contract up to and including death. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Your whole life up to and including dying. I'm like, right. Wait, that wasn't listed in the benefits side of this. Like <laughs> you said college exactly. payments and death, huh? Yeah. There, yeah. It's just a formality. <laughs> Go ahead. Put your name right there. <laughs> so I had a, it didn't take long, but there was a second or two where I just maybe didn't quite have that pen held firmly in my hand. <laughs> So I'm thinking yeah. that going into SEAL training, that pause may have been longer for me. <laughs> <laughs> what what year did you go in? This was back in 92. So Okay. Uh, and so uh, what made you decide that you want to join the military? So my uh, grandparents were in, my dad was in, and so I kind of always just felt like it was in me. And I had that junior college experience like you had where I didn't really have a major uh, I knew I was going to be successful. I knew that. I just didn't know where, where my lane was going to be. And I was paying up for my own college. And I thought all these benefits look good. I wouldn't mind being in the military. I kind of would like to <clears throat> be a veteran and I like the physical stuff and all that. Like, I don't see the downside other than the death part. Like that one, <laughs> that one didn't, <laughs> didn't sound so good, but the rest of it all seemed to fit. And I, I went home and I told my dad and my dad, man, did he get mad? <laughs> really? Oh, he got mad. Cause he'd always told me he didn't want to want me to be in it. Cause he knew what he went through. Hmm. And I thought, okay, he'll pay for my college. Then he'll buy me out. Well, I'll just pay for your college. But he didn't say that. <laughs> like, I guess I'm going in then. Yeah, I, so, I suppose he probably went through in that Vietnam era. He did. Yeah, he did. Yeah. yeah, he he didn't serve in Vietnam. He got to serve locally, but he did a whole lot of different things here in the states and everything. And he's told me some stories and stuff. And uh, but I, I kind of wanted to see what it was that he went through because he described some pretty brutal stuff. Mm-hmm. And I I really kind of wanted to know if I was man enough to do it. I think that's in the heart of a lot of young men, you know. I think we're designed to do that. You know, God has made us to, you know, want to, you know, conquer and, and, you know, go climb that, that mountain, go do something, you know, significant, meaningful, you know, with our, our lives. And, and so that sort of like hunger and thirst, you know, for, for greatness, I, I think that that is a, a good fuel and we just got to point it, you know, in, in the right direction. And I think joining the military you know, looking back, like, I think it's a great idea for guys that really don't know, like what they want to do with their life, because you're young, you're so young, you could do four years and still be so young. It didn't seem like that at the time, you know, when I'm like an 18 year old, four years seems like, you know, such a huge chunk of your life. But I mean, you can go do four years, you know, in the military and in any of these branches, and so many things will be instilled in you that maybe weren't there, you know, before. 
uh, most of all, just, just discipline. And like I said, you'd still be a really young guy uh, with, you know, that, that notch on, on your belt and you could have college paid for, you know, moving forward. And so it does, it's kind of, it buys you a little bit of time. If you don't know what you want to do, go do something in the military. And, uh, and during that time, while you're in, you could start working on, you know, capturing that goal, that vision, you know, whatever it is in your crosshairs that you want to go after. Do you kind of look around at the group of guys that you're going through with and at some point measure yourself at the beginning and go, if these guys are going to make it, I'm better than that guy. I'm better than that guy. Well, here's the thing. As I did look around and what terrified me was all of these guys seem like they're hard as nails. And so I'm thinking, because when I showed up for, for, I was in Bud's class 254, we had already gone like by day one of official SEAL training, or well, you, you do some, what we call in doc indoctrination, you know, yes. training. It's kind of like an on-ramp. And during that time, you're getting like these quote unquote, like beat downs from the instructors. They aren't physically touching you. Some of them are, you know, that's not in the rule books <laughs> or not, not part of the program. Um, you know, but you're going through these really hard grueling, you know, workouts. And I remember suffering through some of these thinking like that really pushed me. That really pushed me pretty hard right there. And I'm looking around at all these guys. We still have a full class, like 173 guys showed up for my class and none of them quit in any of those workouts. So I'm thinking, man, th wow. those are pretty rough. And so now the instructors are saying, you know, hey, you know, look left, look right, take a mental picture of the guys around you, in front of you, behind you. And, uh, you know, chances are, if you make it through training, each of these guys you just took a look at probably didn't make it. Do you really think you're the one? And so that's where I was really doing some sizing up, looking around and thinking like, what? Like, where are these quitters going to come from? You know, I, I know it's not going to be me, but the scary part is, is that, you know, how far down this sort of rabbit hole do we need to go before guys start falling off? And so realizing the majority of the room has got to go, I remember this, this very vividly looking around and trying to find guys that I think will quit. And, you know, the one that captured my attention wasn't someone that I thought would quit. You know, initially, you know, who I was looking at was this guy, Barth. Barth was the stud of the class. There's never a question over who's going to get, you know, first place on a run or like a swim, anything we did. He's in such a league of his own that the question's like, who's getting second place? Because Barth, we, we all know he's getting first. Right. And so there's one of the guys that's going to make it. And I remember like kind of correcting myself, like, what are you doing, dude? You got to find people that are going to quit right now, not guys you think will make it. <laughs> so I'm looking around the room a little bit more. And then I see this other guy, Alex Gagne. And I'm like, how could I forget about Alex Gagne? He's the exact antithesis of Barth. I mean, not only is Alex going to quit, but dude, Gagne, he's, he's going to be the first guy to quit. He's the locker room talk. He's the ugly duckling of the class, always in the back on everything that we're ever doing. And so it's like, all right, well, at least I got that settled in my mind. I know that the first guy that's going to, you know, wind up falling off here and quitting. Well, the irony of it all is that by the time we get to the most difficult portion of SEAL training, which is called Hell Week, you know, who's amongst the first to quit? Not this guy, Gagne. Amongst the first to quit was the start of the class. Yeah. The guy that everybody believed in that was going to make it. You know, the guy that was born and bred to be a Navy SEAL. He, he, he had that sort of gift. Some people are just born with things, right? Well, yeah. Barth had that sort of that DNA that produced the muscle and the stamina to be in first place. And who ultimately, so he was amongst the first to quit, who ultimately made it through the whole pipeline and became what, a Navy SEAL. What do you that think? That guy, Barth, Alex Gagne. What do you think Barth didn't have? Well, you know, and, and part of the SEAL creed goes like this. It says the common man, and this is like speaking of a SEAL, you know, it says the common man with uncommon desire to succeed. So while Barth might've had that DNA at the time, it's apparent he didn't have the desire. Yeah. He didn't have that die before you quit mentality. He did not want it that bad. He didn't have the heart for it. Whereas a guy like Alex Gagne, who we could say he didn't have the blessing of you know the the dna good news is this your dna does not determine your destiny he did have the heart gagne made it through the guy <laughs> that awesome. everyone thought was going to quit right <laughs> the ugly duckling of the class he made it all the way through the program and, and became a navy seal and so that just shows the truth of common man with uncommon desire 
we got the idea wrong in our heads. You know, we think, oh, it takes extraordinary people to go accomplish extraordinary things or kind of like the opening of your podcast where, you know, a lot of dads out there can feel like, am I really the one that's supposed to be, you know, taking the wheel here? I feel unqualified. Well, that's great. You know, because those are the types of people that God uses, you know, go mm -hmm. look through, you know, the, the history of the scriptures. God typically isn't using extraordinary people. He's usually using very common men, flawed men to accomplish extraordinary things. Uh, you could see this in the life of, of Moses. I mean, Moses, he had it all at one point. He was living the life of prestige. He was sitting there at the king's table. He was a prince. And he had a heart for his people. He decided to try and take matters into his own hands and, you know, save one of his own, you know, Israelite countrymen. And he killed the guy that was attacking him. Yeah. And he ended up getting found out. His own people turned on him. You know, he saw a dispute between a couple of his countrymen and he's trying to get in between the two of them. He, he's thinking, I can resolve this. I could be the hero here. And he's kind of saying, come on, boys, what's going on? And, you know, they're looking at him and saying, who made you judge? You know, like, what, are you going to kill us like you killed that Egyptian? Imagine that. He really stuck his neck out there for his own people, and they're turning on him. And so he realizes, oh, no, like, this is this is found out. I'm exposed, and the Pharaoh's going to want to kill me. And sure enough, the Pharaoh did find out. He puts a hit out on Moses, and so Moses is going on the run, takes off like a fugitive, spends the next 40 years of his life living like a nobody, like a nothing, goes from this life of prestige and the palace. And now all he is, is he's just a shepherd following a flock, the most mundane job in the world. I'm sure looking through the rear view mirror of time, thinking about how much better he used to have it. And now he's just out here in the desert, literally going through the dry lands. Like what a dry season in his life. Yes. That's when God calls him in that moment right there. That's when God call, comes to him and, and commissions him and says, I got a task for you to do basically tells him, I want you to go back and I want you to tell the Pharaoh, let my people go. And what was Moses response? He didn't jump at it. Nope. He was just like down on himself. He says, who am I? Like, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and, and tell him, you know, to, to let the people go. And I'm sure he probably felt like at the time, like, God, you should have came to me 40 years ago because back then I was an influencer. I had some pull. I had the blue check mark next to my name, you know, but it's been stripped of me. I'm shadow banned. I'm a nobody now. Uh, but that's just it. Maybe going through this dry season and being in the desert and feeling down and out like that is exactly where you need to be before God could take you to like where he wants you to be. And there is biblical precedent for this because we know how this story plays out. But you could also see this in the lives of so many others. Not only did Moses spend 40 years in the desert before God commissioned him with his big task and job, but the people of Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness before they crossed over that Jordan River into the promised land. Or you think of greats like, you know, Elijah, he was a man of the wilderness or mm -hmm. uh, John the Baptist. He was a man of the Wild wilderness man. before, <laughs> that's right, before he had the opportunity to be the greatest prophet that had ever come in, in Jesus' words, you know, preparing the way for the Lord, or even Jesus himself. Before he started his preaching ministry, where was he? In the desert, 40 days and 40 nights. And so maybe being in that sort of like that desert season of your life, if guys feel like that's where they're at right now, you know, sitting in a cubicle, looking back on, you know, years gone by, thinking that their best years are behind, you know, maybe this is just exactly where you need to be before yeah. God could take you to where he wants you to be. And so Moses was asking the wrong question when he says, who am I? The question isn't, who am I? The, the right question is, who is my God? And he did get around to asking that. Who shall I say sent me? Because that's where the real power is. And so it's such a paradox. Like in order for you to truly find yourself, you have to die to self, you know, first. You have to go to your own, funeral and so yes. that's basically what moses did and then we know how that all turned out amazing because god was behind him he was the source you know of, of power and so really what it comes down to is heart desire and i think like openness you know and willingness to be used by god so alex Gagne, he had that sort of that heart and desire 
Mm-hmm. Um, I would say all the guys that ultimately make it have that heart and that desire. And that's what God is looking for. You know, it, it talks about how in Second Chronicles, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. It's your heart. <laughs> yeah. We know David and Goliath. What was, what was David? He was the runt of the litter. He was the smallest guy in the pack. In fact, he wasn't even in consideration initially, you know, to be the king, you know, when the prophet was looking for one. Uh, but God decided, no, that's my guy right there. And God explains in 1 Samuel, he says that the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Yeah. And what did David do? Well, this little runt of the litter, this little guy, he took on that giant Goliath. And what was unique about David? He had a heart after God's own heart. And so that's really what matters. Not who am I, you know, not my DNA, not my outside appearance. As man looks at outside appearances, what really matters is like, what is on the inside? Do you have a heart that's loyal towards God's heart? And if you do, and you're open to being used by him, then step aside and say, not who am I, but who is my God? Let his power come through. So do you have any like daily reminders or prayers or anything you do? that daily that tie you into that uh concept of being open to god i I guess it's just kind of part of the routine in a way you know it's one of those first things in the morning it's you know grabbing some some coffee and then and then getting into you know god's word and so i I think that that sort of gives you a, a a god's consciousness and and that really is the goal i think for all of us something that i do sometimes is uh i'll have like a mechanical pencil whenever i'm taking the shower i can write like something on the tile of uh, <laughs> the shower not nothing too permanent right my yeah, wife would yeah. be upset with that but you know i i can use that that time to you know write a scripture and then like look at it and think about it a little bit it's a good way to start the day um and then really work on trying to memorize that passage as well and the more that you it's it's like not so much getting into god's word but it's like how much does god's word get into you as it starts to get into you, it begins to transform the way that you think and the way that you look at things. And so more time just saturating in God's word begins to really change the way, you know, that you're thinking and looking at things. And the goal here is for God to truly be like in the throne of our life in every aspect of life. Mm -hmm. And so I certainly have not in any way I don't feel like I've completely attained it or perfected it. Um, but like the apostle Paul says, for getting those things which are behind and pressing forward to those things, which are ahead, the upper call, which is in Christ Jesus. And I think that's what it means to pray without ceasing as well. Yes. Talking about that sort of like praying without ceasing is just constant, like God consciousness, like just being aware of God. And it's like, he's doing everything with you along the way you see it through the lens, you know, of, of spiritual living. Yep. Yeah. I love that you brought that up. That one. I love that pray unceasingly. It's a hard concept to grasp, but man, when I'm in tune with life, that's, that's clicking for sure. Mm-hmm. And I love that you brought up uh, the question. He's asking the wrong question. Questions are so, so important to find a good question. Great question. Quality of your life is determined by the quality of questions you ask yourself and others. So that's great. Can we talk a bit about uh, like Navy SEAL graduation? That's a pretty big moment in somebody's life. Be getting a doctorate degree, you know, getting inducted into the Hall of Fame. All those like those are big peak moments. Uh, what was that like in that time of your life for you? I put everything into becoming a SEAL, and to me, that was that was going to be it. Yeah, becoming a SEAL, I was going to have that identity that I was going for. I was going to be set. This is what all the blood, sweat, tears, and, and, and hard work termination was for. So invested into it. And so finally becoming that, that SEAL, it was surreal. It was definitely one of the happiest, most fulfilling moments of my life. Having that trident, the insignia that says you've done it. Welcome to the brotherhood, you know, pinned into my chest. The strange part, very strange completely unexpected was it it took no no less than 24 hours for that feeling to just go away 
for it to just feel like all the wind got taken out of my sail. And from that point forward, I really felt like I was going through some of the lowest lows. Everything went downhill. I just felt like I was circling a drain from that point forward. And I could not comprehend like, why, you know, like I remember thinking to myself, like, dude, I just like achieved the thing, you know, that was like my, my world. And, and why do I feel this way? And I just couldn't, I couldn't understand why. And it was years later that I got the answer. And so years later, I hear these words by the late Christian philosopher, Robbie Zacharias. And I thought, man, those words hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what I experienced graduation day. I know exactly where I was driving when I heard this over the radio, the silver strain in San Diego. He says, one of the loneliest moments a man will ever experience is when he has achieved that which he thought would deliver the ultimate. And in the end, it lets him down. So one of the loneliest moments a man will ever experience when he's achieved that which he thought would deliver the ultimate and the end it lets him down. What he's referring to right there is something I believe that almost every listener is familiar with, at least to some degree. It's that whole idea that the grass is always greener on the other side. Like you said, you know, we set up these goals or achievements like, you know, getting a, a doctorate or climbing a corporate ladder, or maybe it's like relationship goals, getting married or, you know, having kids. We think that if I could just get to that place, if we just had that thing right there, then I, I would feel like my life is fulfilled. And so we develop a hunger and a thirst for these other things. And we set up these goals and achievements and the hunger and thirst leads to good stuff. It leads to the drive and the discipline. And then you finally get there. You hit your goal. You, you get the trophy, the award, whatever it is, the certificate, it's passed out. And you have your moment where you take it in. It's very enjoyable. But here's the thing is that after you eat that up, the satisfaction doesn't last quite like you expected it to. You start getting kind of hungry again. And so you don't panic here. You just kind of step back for a moment and kind of put on your thinking cap. And after a little bit of thinking and introspect, you realize, I, I know what it is. The reason this thing didn't deliver for me the way that I thought it would, it's simple, man. I didn't go for something big enough. And so if I really want it to, <laughs> to last, I need to go for something bigger, something greater. And so that's what we do as human beings. We start going after that next thing, that next rung of the ladder. And once you figure out what it is, there it is. Okay, I'm thirsting after that thing. And you go through this whole cycle again. You get there, you drink it up. And this is supposed to be the one. You are satisfied. And what happens? It's like a vicious cycle. You just get hungry and thirsty all over again. And seemingly, seemingly there just is no end. But there is an end. And that is the whole point to that quote. One of the loneliest moments a man will ever experience is when he's achieved that which he thought would deliver the ultimate in the end it lets him down what happens when you finally arrive at a place where you no longer like all the previous times before can say oh i know what i'll do i'll just go to the next rung of the ladder well, why can't you do that this time well because you're at the last rung of the ladder you you, you can't say okay i know what i'm gonna do i'm just gonna get a little bit more elevation climb the mountain a little bit higher no you can't do that because you're at the peak of the mountain there's nothing left to climb and, and yet worse than all the previous times before, because you're hungry and thirsty for something more, something next, but there is no next. That's where you get the truth of those words. And you do see that in people who reach the, the pinnacle of their careers or their, their field, right? With professional athletes, you know, rock stars or movie stars, they got all that the world has to offer. They made it to the top. And what do we see going on in their lives? it's like a constant drama. They're destroying their own lives with drugs and alcohol, committing suicide. And we watching from the outside can't comprehend. We can't wrap our mind around it. Like why, why are they just throwing it all away like this? Don't they realize what they have? Don't they realize what people would trade to be in their shoes? But maybe that's just it. And we hate to, we hate to hear these words. We don't want to believe it, having all the world has to offer isn't all that's cracked up to be. Well, I think that, that that's true. And so in a sense, you know, becoming a Navy SEAL, that was my, my achieving all the world had to offer. In fact, yes. you know, Jesus, he puts it best. He says, what's it profit a man if he gains the whole world 
but in the end loses his soul. And so that's the real issue there is that if your soul is not oriented correctly, if you do not have peace with your creator, have no expectation to have peace in your life here on earth. So that was the issue at the time, but I didn't know that that was the issue. I could look back and say that was the issue. I didn't have true peace with my creator. I didn't have a right relationship, you know, with God, but that, that time would, would come. There's a, there's a guy named Aaron Walker or big A is a lot of guys I know call him. And he had a quote and it was, uh, uh, if you come home with a pocket full of money to a house full of strangers, you know, what do you got? And I was like, Hmm. man, I remember a time in my life where the pocket full of money was so important and the people around me were there but the money was the important thing. And so thankful that that's changed, but yeah, we get gain the whole world. Right. You lose your soul. Like, what do you got? Yeah. There's only certain things that we can actually take across that, that border, you know, from you brought up uh, professional athletes years after the Rams won the Super Bowl, I had an opportunity. I was in Tory Holt's kitchen. So the, the famous wide receiver, we we're having a conversation and I said, hey, I got an unusual question for you, but I really want to know. You caught that pass and uh, one-handed and you'd hurt your shoulder. And he goes, yeah, I, I took some pain stuff and everything. And I go, I go, but my question is, when you celebrated, only one arm went up. This arm went up this high. This arm went up this high. Tell me about that. And he goes, oh, I'll, I'll tell you about that. And he goes, I couldn't lift my shoulder. I couldn't lift my arm. So I went into the game in the second half, knowing that as a wide receiver, I couldn't lift my arm. Wow. So when that pass was thrown, I knew I only could catch it with one hand. He goes, and funny enough, yeah, when you look at the highlight of that, I did only raise one arm because the other arm didn't go up. (laughs) I intended it to, but yeah, it didn't go up. And then he says, so when the Super Bowl, everything's cool. We're doing all the parties and, you know, it goes until, you know, it's time to leave and get on the flight. We got all this, all this tchotchkes, all this stuff that people have given us in addition to the baggage we brought with us. And it's time to leave the hotel, like the greatest day of my life, Super Bowl champion. And I think to myself, I've got a hurt arm and five times as many bags as I brought to this hotel room where are the people that are going to take all this stuff away from me? Don't they know who I am? I just won the <laughs> Super Bowl. I just caught a touchdown. Because <laughs> in that moment, I realized how insignificant that was. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so I heard you talking about that. And I'm like, yeah, it sounded just like, just like Tori. He's like, it was an accomplishment, but it was only temporary. It was just, right. and how quickly he was humbled and reminded we're just men. <laughs> That's right. And the things that you achieve, you know, sometimes you, you might think that this is like who you are to other people, right? Your identity. And uh, it's sometimes you're just the flavor of the month or the flavor of the week or that that, that was maybe just the, the news highlight, you know, the flavor of the day. And then, you know, those fair weather friends or fans, you know, they, they go away. Where are they to help them, you know, with yeah. all those bags in the end? So how'd you get out of that, that time, you know, you graduate, everything's the greatest, and then it's suddenly not the greatest. How'd you get past Mm -hmm. that? So, you know, there was a lot going on that mentor of mine that I had mentioned, Scott Helvenston. Yeah, sadly, tragically, he had died overseas. And uh, I had to watch how that went down on national television. Uh, March 31st, 2004. He was, you know, one of those uh, former Navy SEALs that uh, joined Blackwater and, uh, and they were ambushed in Fallujah, Iraq. And, you know, I saw all kinds of horrific just scenes of video footage of, you know, what had happened with that. And so that like, I don't even know how to put it. Um, that put a lot of like hatred in my heart, you know, towards, you know, just the insurgency, you know, in, in Iraq. And, uh, it, it, it put like feelings of like just revenge. I couldn't wait for my opportunity to, you know, get some get back you mm-hmm. know, for that. And so I was kind of passing the time on a, on a bad fuel, but it is a fuel you can run on. It's a fuel of revenge. And, uh, at the same time, you know, in the off time, I was doing foolish things since I felt like I didn't feel anymore. Well, what made me feel, 
what made me feel is to go out and drink, cut loose with the guys. And that just ended with a lot of stupidity, you know, by the end of the night or waking up the next morning. Um, and I wish I could tell you I felt remorse at the time, but I would just laugh off whatever I did. You know, whatever I did is so foolish. It's pathetic and sad looking back on it. It's just personal robbery. You know, but people would be informing me, you know, do you remember what you did last night? I would be blacked out. Like, no. And they'd tell me and I would just crack up about it. think it's funny. Um, and everything really came to a head one night where I needed 26 stitches after blacking out and uh, family confronting me like, dude, you're, you're destroying your life. And I wish I could tell you I felt remorse at the time, but I just, I just didn't. I, I thought it was comical. I thought that's just living the rock star life. You know, I'm just doing yeah. wild things. And uh, they are pleading with me to go to church with them. And I hadn't been in a long time. I finally decided, all right, I'll go. And so I'm only going to get them off my back. And well, all of a sudden from tuned out to, I just start becoming tuned in uh, to the message. And uh, it was out of second Kings chapter five, the story of Naaman, who's this like yeah. Syrian commander. He's had great success in battle. He could be a Navy seal, had their ventures to take such a thing during his time. Um, he had it really going on. He had the identity, he had the status, even the King enjoyed Naaman's company, you know, so he's rubbing shoulders with people in, in high places, which tends to be the case when you achieve great things. Uh, he's got it really going on, living that life, but it gets pointed out, Naaman had leprosy. And Jesus, looking back, specifically called out Naaman. He said, nobody during the time of Naaman had ever been healed of leprosy. And so now I kind of circle back and, and, and picture Naaman's life again, so much for all that success, so much for this outward man, you know, this commander. It's, it's just a persona. It's a facade. What's really going on underneath that armor? Like what's really going on underneath that clothing? What's really going on is he's literally deteriorating. He's falling apart. He's a dead man walking. <laughs> and it's like, as I'm listening, thinking like how much I relate with that guy right there. Yeah. I have this persona on the outside. I'm a Navy SEAL. I'm a rock star. I got it going on. But what's the truth that I'm hiding from everybody? I, I feel like I'm deteriorating. I feel like I'm falling apart. I feel like this dead man walking. And so I find myself listening now and I feel like I'm the only person in the audience. I feel like the guy is just speaking directly to me. Mm. I'm sure there's plenty of other people there that night that felt the same way because that's just how God works. Uh, but Naaman, he does everything he can do to fix himself. But guess what? He can't fix himself. And isn't that us? We try everything, every, everything we can to fix ourselves. We can't fix ourselves. But he hears about this prophet that serves the God of Israel that could do the impossible, what he has not been able to do. So he makes a 150 mile trip with horses and chariots. He's visiting this prophet and this prophet won't even come to the door, disrespects him, relays a message through a servant. If you just go dip yourself in the Jordan River seven times, when you come up, your flesh will be restored to you. You will be clean. Naaman becomes furious. He, he, he turns, he's leaving in a rage. He's saying what his expectation was that this guy would come out and, and basically put on a big show, you know, wave his hand over the place, call in the name of the Lord, his God, and strike the leprosy away. And then he goes on about, about the whole issue of dipping himself into water. Like, think I haven't tried that yet, pal, trying to wash it <laughs> off. He's saying the waters where I'm from in Damascus are far better than the waters over here uh, of Israel. So as he's leaving in this rage, you know, if people haven't caught it yet, what's his real obstacle, his real problem? Well, his real obstacle here is his, himself. It's his pride. Pride. And so his men come running up to him and they're pleading with him. Come on, Naaman, you know, if you, if you would have gave me some big, great thing to do, you would have done it. And again, that, that's us. You know, if something, if, if, if we're going to get something, like if we're, if we're prideful people, we, we don't like to take a free handout and we don't want it to be easy. It's like, no, I want to earn it. Mm -hmm. So what if the guy did come out and give him some big, great thing to do? you know, some big rite of passage to get to, you know, being cleansed of the leprosy, some hard, difficult task, you know, he would probably be like, all right, show me where to start. But because it seemed like a really simple thing, just go wash and be clean. What it seemed like to him was a foolish thing, it just seemed like foolishness. And that's exactly what the New Testament says about the preaching of the cross. It says the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. Well, no doubt about it. Naaman here is in a state of perishing, but something these guys say, 
God uses it. It gets through and he decides he'll do it. And so Naaman is about to do what I think is by far the most difficult thing for any one of us, any man to do. He is about to eat some humble pie. You know, as he's changing direction, there's a whole lot more going on than just a physical change of direction. You know, I, I think that there's a, a sort of mental, emotional, spiritual change of direction going on. I think he's getting it now. In order for me to live, I must die. I, I got to take that walk. I got to go to my own funeral right now, and then I'll truly live. I think he understands that it's not washing this stuff off. It's not washing off. It's that if I'm faithful, if I do what the God of Israel wants me to do, he will be faithful, and he'll do the hard part. He's going to do that heavy lifting. And so he dips himself seven times in that water. And guess what? That seventh time he comes up and the filth of that leprosy is gone. He has brand new skin, as the scriptures put it, like that of a baby. I remember hearing that, listening, relating, feeling so inspired. And then I kind of felt like this is the part where there's no longer like any similarity, right? Like it worked out for him. Good for him. <laughs> oh, no. <you> know? <laughs> right. It's like watching a movie and it's like that hero that goes through all this adversity and, and somehow yeah, makes it through. And then it all works out for the hero in the end. And then typically what happens here is it's no longer time to live vicariously through this character. The movie's over. So the credits begin to roll and the lights come on. And now it's time for you to you know get out of that world and go face reality. Well, I think I should make a point here that the credits don't roll right there, that just as God provide a way out for name him, he provided a way out for us. And it's not dipping ourselves into some water. What happened was God dipped his son, Jesus, down into the world. And he lived the holy, perfect, sinless life that you and I could never live. So that leprosy, if folks haven't caught it yet, it's a picture. It's a, it's a type. It's a picture of our sin. Mm -hmm. We, spiritually speaking, are lepers. You know, we are spotted and blotted and blemished. And guess what? There's nothing we can do to get it off ourselves like Naaman couldn't get his leprosy off himself. But God provide a way out. And what is that way out? Well, that's Jesus. He went to the cross. And at the cross, uh, he didn't go up there to be some example. At the cross, he went up there to trade skin with you and I, to take our leprosy, our sin, as it were, upon himself so that we could be switched and lavish with God's grace and his mercy. Not only conquering the power of sin, but rising again from the dead, conquering the power of death. Not even the grave can hold him down. And then he declares from that resurrected life, speaking of that resurrected life, because I live, you also can have this. You also can live. But what's the turning point? How, how do we receive that? Well, we've got to do the name and thing, humble ourselves by doing a 180. A 180 in what sense? Change of mind, change of attitude about sin. That's called repentance, turning from it, like turning from darkness toward light. And then you put your faith and trust in Jesus to do what? Well, just as name entrusted the God of Israel to be faithful and do the heavy lifting, we trust Jesus. That's why we call him a savior. Saves you from your sin. He does the heavy lifting. And the moment that any man does that, he doesn't just have another man's word on it. He has God's word on it. He, God says, he'll remember the sin no more. That's huge. I mean, we could say that to a friend, you know, if we forgive him or, you know, a spouse, you know, forgotten, you know, it's gone, you know, and for the most part it can be, but you still have a sort of faint memory of it. As far as God's concerned, he says he removes it as far away as the East is from the West. And how far is that? It's forever. It's gone. Remember your sin no more and a place for you in eternity, a new identity, the, the true identity that we're always meant to have. All these other identities leave you hungry and thirsty for more. Jesus says, if you drink of my living water, you will never thirst again. Never thirst again. How is that? These other things leave me thirsty for more. He says, never thirst again. You never thirst again in the sense that you are complete. In Christ, you have no need for another. There is no need for another. And what's beautiful about that is once you're in that place, then everything else you do, it takes its proper seat, its proper category. You can actually enjoy those second things like you never enjoyed them before. When you try and make second things, first things, it's out of order. But when they take their proper seat or mm -hmm. they're supplementary to life, that's where you get in the scriptures, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now I could actually go back to being a seal 
and enjoy it in a way I never enjoyed it before. You know, <laughs> awesome. the way I looked at it was being a seal for Christ. And you've got that personality when you're all in, you're all in. So when that switch flipped for you, what were some of the crazy things that you did? Oh, I was uh, like a bull in a china shop as far as, you know, trying to evangelize others. That's for sure. You know, because it really, <laughs> it, it hit me. It, it was like, wow, this was so close to me for so long. And I thought I kind of knew like what it was before like i thought i kind of like understood what it was to like be a, a christian it was on my dog tag you know <laughs> yeah yeah um but i didn't really know and so it was always right there i didn't realize it but once i had you know realized it i realized it's that close for everybody else as well and so i was just doing everything i could as a new believer not knowing a whole lot about the scriptures, but knowing what happened to me, knowing that I'm like that blind person that look at all I know is I was blind and now I see. And I realized that a lot of you are blind and I want to help you find that sight. And so this is who I was. This is what I heard. And, and this is what's going on now. And so I was just going around evangelizing. Nobody had to tell me to go do it. I knew like, I need to go do this. Like I just found the cure, you know, I just found the <laughs> cure to cancer. Like no one needs to go convince me to go tell everyone else about it now. And so I, I really hit the ground running with that pretty hard. We talked about reading the Bible and I'm currently on a plan, a 317 day plan to read the Bible. And I'm about 37 days away from finishing it. So I'm really excited about that. You mentioned you read the Bible also. <laughs> How long did it take for you to read it? So I, I deployed pretty soon after becoming what I would say a, a believer and so uh, I had a little bit of reading time, you know, on my hands, you know, sometimes early in the morning or whenever I would just, I would take all those opportunities I had to read. And I was given a, a Bible that had a reading plan uh, built into it. And so I took that 12 month reading plan and I made it my goal to try and read a month's worth every two days. And so I did that. And so I read through the whole Bible cover to cover uh, in 24 days. <laughs> You mentioned that to me earlier and I was just blown away knowing what I currently do. Like, oh my goodness, 24 days. Yeah. As, as a new believer, I was hungry for it. Yeah. I could not get enough. I really couldn't. I was a slow reader back then because I, I always found a way to, like I said, like I think one of the only books I ever read cover to cover prior to that was Rogue Warrior. And uh, apart from that, any book report I ever did, sadly, I never read the whole book. I always found the cliff notes. I always yep. found some way to kind of like survey it, skim through. Um, and so because of that, I wasn't a very good reader. I was very slow <laughs> at that time. So that's a huge task for anybody, but like, right. that, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, as a spiritual leader of your home, what, what are some things that you think are important? Uh, maybe a story, maybe something you want to pass along to the men, uh, just any, any thoughts around that with your experience and you're married and two kids, if we hadn't mentioned that before. So, you know, again, guys, I have not perfected this in any way, but I do know this is that, you know, God needs to be number one preeminent, like in the household, in the family and the children need to, you know, see that. And so, you know, actions do speak louder than words. We don't want to be those people that say, you know, do as I say, but not as I do. And so we got to make a conscious effort to be practicing, you know, this in, in front of our, our kids. And so I, I think some of the obvious ones is like just the practice of, of prayer, you know, or praying before, you know, every meal, uh, just as it says in, in Joshua, like when you sit down, you know, to eat, you know, to, you know, tell your kids, you know, of these things. And so uh, we also have a, uh, like a children's, uh, book. I'm trying to remember what it's called on the cover really doesn't matter, but it's got these awesome, I think it's called the Bible action book. And so before they go to bed, um, if it's not too late, you know, cause sometimes they do stay up a little late and it's like, we need to get these kids to sleep. Uh, but yeah. we'll, we'll go through like a, a Bible story, you know, there and the, the action Bible, I think that's what it's called. The Bible action, action Bible, something like that. It's got all these graphics. It looks like a comic, you know, uh, book and it, it shares these these Bible stories in a very relatable way, you know, to the kids that can yeah. read about Samson and his strength, or David, you know, taking on Goliath, or 
you know, Jesus in the desert, you know, for 40 days and 40 nights. I think it's awesome. And I even learned from reading that one. <laughs> it's like, it actually helps me to communicate. Like, I really like the way they communicate that right there. That, that sticks. That's helpful. And Have so, your kids uh, ever brought you a story that you hadn't shared with them and you don't know where they got it from, but they bring you a Bible story or an example of something? Well, they're not like the four, the, Noah just turned five. So he's, okay. sometimes like at, you know, at church, they might come to me with a story. And it's funny the way that they like, you know, learn it or hear it. Nothing really jumps out, but it's kind of like, I'm trying to figure out what story is he talking about right now? Yes, yes, you know? yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. I love that. Like that just yeah. brings so much joy to my heart when they're trying to share the gospel back with me. Mm -hmm. And one of my daughters will teach the other daughter. And sometimes I'll observe it. Like, uh -huh. Oh my gosh, I just got to catch this. You know, yeah, the bird. it's a beautiful thing. And then there was some type of a leaf, maybe a branch i i can't remember what kind was it an olive branch yes <laughs> <laughs> oh so i that's love great. that and then one of the things that's it's it's fun to observe is uh my daughter her thing is anytime she's like you know at, at the park and and meets like a new kid or if she meets like the kid's parents because the parents are usually right there she'll ask them do you believe in god do you know who Jesus is? And it's it's just awesome to watch because you could tell like a lot of the times um, that's just not a part of what that family's about. And and just watching them like struggle with it because like if you bring up like right taboo religion and politics, if yeah, you bring it yeah. up to some other adult and they don't want to be hearing it, like they'll kind of let you know. They'd be like, I, I don't want to talk about that. It's kind of hard to turn down like an eight year old girl. And so you could tell they don't want to talk about this right now. And they're like humming and on and, uh, 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 and, and she'll be pressing them. Well, well, do you, what, what do you do? Do you know who Jesus is? Do you, and I'm just sitting back, like watching, like, Oh, this is awesome. She's already evangelizing, you know, as an eight year old in the park oh, that's <laughs> and fantastic. telling the kids about it too. And, and, you know, it's just like, parents are just like, I don't know how to respond. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Absolutely. What type of things do you hope that they kind of pick up or learn or uh, core values or what do you, what do you hope the kids grow into? Sure. Um, I guess an acronym would, would work for this. Uh, yeah. We'll call it RPGs <laughs> instead of rocket <laughs> propelled grenades. It would be uh, reading, praying, uh, going to church and, and sharing the Lord. And so those are the principles, I think, right there. That's the fundamentals of Christianity that nobody ever outgrows. Uh, just like there's fundamentals, right, to, you know, being a, a Navy SEAL that you never outgrow. Uh, this is the push-ups and pull-ups of, of Christianity is reading the Bible, <laughs> praying, going to church, and, and sharing your faith. Oh, you're talking my language, push-ups and pull-ups <laughs> and <laughs> RPGs. This is wonderful. Uh in your book, you, you got Proverbs 22, six in there, direct your children onto the right path. And when they're older, they will not leave it. Like just the, the training and discipline and correction and all the things as a dad that we need to do. So I, I love that that was in your book and I love, I love RPG. That is just a simple formula. <laughs> <laughs> so, so simple. Um, do you and your wife uh, pray together away from the kids? We do. Yeah, any any time anything comes up that we should be, you know, praying about, we we pray together. We pray for our kids, for family, you know, for nation. And so, yeah, um, I would say early on in in the marriage, the prayer life was probably like a little bit more, you know, private. And and I don't know why, you know, but it it just was. But then it became just no thing to be, you know, praying together. Maybe that's just how people feel like when they when they pray, especially as like a new believer, it could be difficult to maybe be put on the spot because you get concerned yeah. about things you shouldn't be concerned about. Like, what does the other person think about right. like what yes. I'm, I'm saying yes. right now? But God designed us to be, you know, doing this together. Well, on the one hand, Jesus talks about, you know, praying in private. We should be doing that. But also they prayed corporately. You see that in the book of Acts, you know, that they prayed all in, you know, one accord you know, with one another. And uh, the scriptures actually do tell us to be praying for one another as well. Mm -hmm. The leader of my church, uh, he's been leading churches for over 40 years. And uh, 
he says, people come to me, couples, and they say, hey, we got problems. We want to talk about it. Goes, so I listen for a long time. And then I always come back with my first question. When was the last time you prayed together? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like I, talk, I could talk, probably... talk. And then I, I asked that question almost as if I didn't hear anything they said. And they look at me funny like, that's your question? Didn't hmm. you hear what we said? Right. I heard you. Yeah, I've heard it related to like a relationship, you know, should be kind of like a, a, a triangle. And so like your wife, your spouse, you know, occupies, you know, one point on the triangle and you occupy uh, another on the bottom end and wherever you, you can't meet horizontally, well, God's at the top. You can always meet like vertically, you know, with them. And I mean, simple as that, there's a hundred percent truth to that right there. Yeah. I've heard a lot of guys that they say they're afraid to pray with their wife and, you know, pray for the courage to, to do that. And it's awesome that, that you're doing that. And I think a key to marriage. Yeah, maybe an acronym would help for them there. This is when I learned it at church because, uh, yeah, what are they afraid of? Like maybe just not knowing like how to lead the prayer. Jesus gave a good example how to lead the prayer. Um, but, you know, here's an acronym, ACTS, like the book of ACTS. And so it would be adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. So adoration, what are we doing there? Well, just like Jesus did, you know, in, in his prayer, like our father in heaven, like he just, he's, he's expressing like, like how it be your name. We're, we're adoring adoration. We're adoring like who God is. And so you're talking about just like, man, you're the creator and sustainer, you know, of the universe. You made the stars, you made us. And so you're starting off your prayer by adoring who God is. And then confession would be just your time, you know, to confess sins. And Jesus gave this example as well, you know, forgive us our, our, our debts as we forgive our debtors. And so this is to be a daily practice. It's not just something we ask for forgiveness of once and then we're saved. Well, yeah, you know, you've confessed your sins and, and you're regenerated, you're saved in that sense. But on a daily basis, Jesus gave us the example that we should be confessing our sins. Um, and then Thanksgiving, just talk about the things you're thankful for. And it's countless things if you really start thinking about it. And then supplication just means the requests. And so you're making your request to God you know, whatever things that you have need of or requesting for, you know, healing of, of, of others. And so that's a good outline right there. It doesn't cover it all, but that should get your, that should get guys started. You know, yeah. I, I think they, they can do that individually and then with their wives. So acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and, and supplication. That's fantastic. And simple, directive, guys can take orders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's your standard operating procedures right there, boys. SOP, SOP, absolutely. Um, any other things that you want to uh, to bring up before we close out? Mm, I think that we covered a good amount. Um, we could definitely do it again sometime. I could keep going, but <laughs> oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah, I, I appreciate you and appreciate you sharing. You, uh, your book is called Seal of God. So yeah, guys, Seal of God. Right? They can get signed copies of it uh, at my website, which is not Seal of God. Um, it's sealofchrist.com. Um, try to get the other URL. Just couldn't do it. We talked about that before. But yeah, sealofchrist.com. And uh, I sign all the copies that go out from there. And uh, I've also got some apparel on there. You know, in the SEAL teams, we're known as Frogmen. And, uh, and so I've, I've got a T-shirt on there. In fact, it's the shirt that I have on right now. It has what's called uh, the bone frog. The logo is so, awesome. Yeah, the, the bone frog is something we wear to honor or remember fallen frogmen. So that's why we wear skeleton or bone. Uh, so we just remember these guys that have shed their blood, you know, for our earthly freedoms. But you see the cross that's in the insignia there. Uh, the cross is to represent not only these seals, uh, but the savior. So I always share with people that, and it says on the back of the shirt, those words, greater love is no one than this and the one that lays down his life for his friends. So these guys, you know, shed their blood for our earthly freedoms. But the one who spoke those words of greater love, you know, that was Jesus. And he shed his blood, not for our earthly freedoms, but for our eternal freedoms. And the people that hear that on the street or in the mall or in the airport, because they always ask about the frog. They want to know what's, what's the frog about. And so you can share with them these guys, these fallen, you know, seals. Uh, and then they want to know, yeah, like those words, too, I like those words. Well, there's no scripture reference on the back intentionally. 
Because if there was a John 15, 13 on the back, most likely this person that's asking me right now wouldn't ask. Yep. They'd be like, oh, it's one of those Bible shirts. You know, but since it's not there, it gives you that opportunity uh, to explain that to them. And the response is, it's, it's almost the same. It's almost scripted every time. When you share with them, these guys shed their blood for your earthly freedoms. Jesus shed his blood for your eternal freedoms. They say, wow, I never thought about it that way. <laughs> and so the shirt has actually turned out to be a great evangelistic tool. So those shirts are on the site as well. And uh, they're high quality shirts too. And then I also got a hat uh, with the same thing with the bone frog and uh, the words in the back. That's awesome. So SealofChrist.com. Awesome. And that shirt is so soft and comfortable. A friend of mine bought me one of those and it is, uh, sometimes I get hesitant to buy a shirt or whatever, because I'm afraid it might be uncomfortable or whatever. That shirt is comfortable. Yeah. I, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't mean to get high on my own supply, but man, I wear these shirts almost every day. They are very comfortable. <laughs> They're a nice blend. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I always like to close out the podcast with a challenge. So I don't know if you've got a challenge you'd like to throw out there to the, to the dads in the group. If so, I'll sure. let you do it. Yeah. Well, I challenge these guys to go advance the kingdom of God. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. He says, enemy occupy territory. That is what this world is. But Christianity is a story of how our rightful king has landed. You might say in disguise. And now he's calling us all to take part in his great campaign of sabotage. So I'm calling out all the guys to go take part in a campaign of sabotage and who doesn't want to be a saboteur you know that really resonates with me and what are we sabotaging we are sabotaging the plans of the ultimate terrorist the ultimate suicide bomber the enemy of our soul just like any suicide bomber out there that's strapped they know they're going down they're going to die but they're not content with just that what's their goal they want to take out as many people with them as they possibly can in the process what's the navy seal do sabotage their plans what are we supposed to do we're going up against the ultimate suicide bomber satan he's strapped he's going down he knows it we know it we've read the back of the book but he's not content with just that is he what's he want to do he wants to take out as many people with him as he possibly can in the process and we got to make that personal that's our family members our friends our co-workers but god has given you the task of sabotaging him and the way that you do that is with the greatest weapon that we have it's the gospel. There's no better weapon to charge the kingdom of darkness with than the gospel. So we're supposed to be getting out there and sharing the gospel everywhere we go in every aspect of life. You might go into it dragging your feet. It's not always easy, but man, you'll, you'll come home. You'll come home clicking your heels. Happy you did that operation. Wow. That's great. We talked about that at the beginning, dragging our feet a little bit sometimes. And even uh, the the mentor, I believe you mentioned. Scott. Yeah. Scott? No, not Scott. Oh, no, uh, Ray Comfort. There you go. Said that even he drags his feet sometimes, but he always feels better afterwards after after engaging it. So, man, that's a great challenge. And man, for guys that uh, aren't comfortable with that, that one will make them uncomfortable. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> but it feels well, good. Another after thing Ray you... says is we pay money to feel uncomfortable when we go to an amusement park. You know, or anytime you jump out of an airplane or, or go down, a, you know, a roller coaster, we're paying money for that feeling. You can have that feeling for free. For Just free. go share Jesus with somebody. And get some eternal rewards. Like you exactly. get a free thrill and an eternal reward. Two for there one. you go. There's your <laughs> ROI. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. That's a really neat way to think about it, to to not only do it because, but also you get the thrill out yeah, of it as well. for the thrill. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, I, I thank you so much, Chad. This has been fantastic. I hope the guys love this. I know I did. And your book is tremendous. So guys, seriously, buy the book, buy the book. It's so relatable to so many men. We've, we've lived a similar story, maybe not become Navy SEALs, but we've, we've had those times in our lives where we needed a little something and we figured out a way to endure and, and make our way through it. Well, thank you so much for having me on. You asked a lot of really good questions. I enjoyed our conversation and, and let's definitely do it again. Awesome. I, I'd love it. I'd love it. Thank you.